Hello and welcome to the original podcast. I'm your host, Jamie C. Foster from the YouTube channel known as Inside a Mind. And my co-host today is Eric Nielsen from the YouTube channel known as The Looney Turtle. Uh, hello everyone. Good to have another episode of the original podcast. Uh, today with us as our guest is Peter New, the voice for Big Macintosh and My Little Pony, or the face of Jay, an unscrupulous real estate developer in Supernatural, as well as a variety of uh, other roles, both on the big screen and the little screen, and even a few roles behind the scenes. Uh, welcome, Peter. Hello. Delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, so you have a lot of experience in um, both voice acting as well as acting. So naturally, uh, probably the best place to start would be um, what kind of got you into this this field? And, and do you have a preference between um, the voice acting or the uh, film acting? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I... Uh... I, I've always acted, really. Like I, I sort of cast my mind back to when I was, you know, about six or so, and I would uh, perform for my family uh, as all of the characters in a menagerie of animals, led by a uh, a character very eloquently named Ruff Ruff the Talking Dog. Um, <laughs> Ruff Ruff was a talking dog. I don't know if that was very clear, but there you go. <laughs> what? Uh, I know. Mind blown. Yeah. Uh, but I never really I never really stopped performing after that. I knew very early I wanted to be an actor. I just it was just always kind of there for me. Uh, so after I you know I did a couple of plays and things in high school, I toured uh, internationally with a, a company called the Vancouver Youth Theater when I was in my teens. Uh, and then um, after high school, I, I started my own comedy troupe because I just thought I would start a comedy troupe here in Vancouver and um, bingo, bango, I'd be famous being a sketch comedian. And that didn't work. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so at a certain point, I had to decide, you know, do I want to get a, a job job or do I want to keep doing what I'm doing but not be paid in beer and instead be paid in money? Uh, and that required getting an agent and uh, starting to actually audition for other people's things instead of just get on stage and make funny. Mm. Uh, and then that led to where I am now, which is, you know, where I am now. Yes, voice acting for a bunch of, of different shows and doing uh, extras, uh, being an extra in a lot of films as well. No, I don't. I'm not an extra in a lot of things. That's not how we uh, call that. And an extra is someone who is in the background, whose face you wouldn't necessarily recognize, who has no lines, and who uh, gets paid poorly, and who cannot use it as a credit on their resume. <laughs> um, that's not what I do. Oh, okay. Is it called uh, a walk-on, uh, or is that just is that for? A uh, it 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 could be it could be called walk on uh i mean it depends on you know i just go to an audition and i get a job right yeah, yeah. so an extra an extra doesn't audition for their their material That's true, they just yeah. they're 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 walking set basically yeah. i've i've you worked know? on extra before so uh that is very true <laughs> literally yeah. just you just there uh, yeah, exactly. And and not to demean that job, right? Cuz it's a hard job and and we need people to do it in the in the business. Every piece of the thing counts making it happen. But uh I just do want to qualify that that the job that I do is is called a principal performer by and large, okay. which is, you know, a character that has, you know, I mean there's an actor role uh in here that's what they call it here in BC anyway, as they say if you have six lines or fewer, it's called an actor role, and then six lines or more is called a principal role, and then sort of a large enough part, and they decide it's called a guest star or a supporting lead. Um, and I've done all of those jobs, I've even done lead jobs. So I mean, I've, it it really just depends on the uh, audition. Okay, um, and some of your early work is on, like it was film projects. You, yeah. you were talking about yesterday. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's on the um, YouTube channel, the Legend of Bonefish, or what was the? Uh, I forget the name <laughs> yeah. of the channel, but I do know I, I watched that a lot right. of the videos. <laughs> that sounds right. You watch them? You, what'd you think of them? Um, they pretty, remind me pretty of some stupid. of. <laughs> uh, they they feel like uh, some of my early YouTube videos, but better. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were uh, uh, those were all those were all comedy sketches that we uh, used to do live. 
and then uh, we just because YouTube wasn't a thing when we were doing our thing, so we just kind of ten years later we decided as a bunch of brand new middle aged guys we thought well let's put this thing together now and put it on YouTube and before we're completely irrelevant, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know and that was fun, but I don't know that they necessarily translated because it's interesting. I think comedy changes, and so I think what was really really funny in the uh, in the 90s is you know not necessarily funny in 2003 when we made those which is even possibly less funny now in um uh, in 2020 jesus yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah comedy has changed pardon my I mean, blasphemy <laughs> <laughs> 2010 yeah, I, I think is uh, was comedy as well that's complete from if you look at the internet humor from then and what it's like now it's like very different in, in terms oh for of sure that. yeah it, um, I, I especially kind of liked the um, Legend of Bonefish, where it just, <laughs> the entire time, uh, you're just straight face going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, this guy's describing my character, it. My character's name in that sketch is Lip King. And, uh, and basically, my job there is to make the water noises of the swimming bone. Well, the guy whose character name is Boner, uh, he uh, his job is to take a plastic femur and make it look like it's swimming and then the other guy is giving this monologue uh it's it was always bizarre and yet it always made people laugh and cheer and so we thought well uh, if we're gonna start filming these things that better be one of them yeah um how, how did you guys kind of come upon some of the the ideas in those uh short videos uh well, again, like because they all originated from when we were performing a, uh, a show. We were trying to do a show every week, uh, which we succeeded at largely for most of five years. And uh, and so part of what we were trying to challenge ourselves to do was generate new comedy ideas weekly. So, uh, you know, at a certain point, who knows where those ideas come from? Like part of it comes from just going out with the troupe and riffing and making each other laugh. And part of it is just sitting there with your notebook and trying to come up with something that makes you laugh or that you think is going to make at least one of the other guys laugh. And then, you know, and then you workshop it, rehearse it and put it on a stage and see if it makes other people laugh. And if it makes other people laugh, well, then you keep it. That's the beautiful thing about comedy, right? Is if they laugh, then it's working. And if they don't, then something's wrong. And you've got to figure out, is that in the writing or is it in the way we performed it or you know how's it how's it wrong and at a certain you know eventually there are certain things that we definitely scrapped there, i remember there was a sketch called um ah no i don't remember it now i don't remember the name of it but it was uh it was a sketch that sort of each of us try it was a one person thing and each of us tried to do it um because we all thought it was really really funny uh and uh, each of us tried it and none of us could make it make other people laugh so mm. we, we scrapped it. But, you know, it, we all thought it was hilarious. But, you know, it's sort of disappeared now into the annals of history because it didn't work. Okay. And you've, you've got to be kind of, you know, I guess mercenary about comedy because yeah. you, can't, you, can't, you can't hang on to something that isn't making people chuckle. Yeah, That's with true. some projects, you, you win some, you, you can't quite get the others. So That's yeah. nice. it's nice to have a, a variety of different projects. That you're working yeah, on. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But I also, I mean, through through that, I, I guess I kind of learned that when you're writing comedy, part of it is about, you know, th throwing as much as you can at it. Because even if somebody laughs at joke number one, they're not going to laugh at joke number two. And the person that laughs at joke number two didn't, you know what I mean? Like, there's always, yeah. there's got to be something for everybody in it. It um, must be so hard to write comedy. I, it's just looking at it. Because I've always liked writing stories, and but but. When I've ever come to comedy, I've always found that as the hardest one, just mainly because it's just so subjective. Yeah, it is. And um, I think all you can really do is make yourself laugh. And if you're making yourself yeah. laugh, then there's a pretty fair chance that someone else is going to laugh at it. Because ultimately, uh, I mean, the way I look at it, laughter is just, I mean, if you're writing anything else, sorry to jump around, if you're writing anything else, what you're sorry. trying to do is is evoke an emotion from the audience you're trying to get them to feel sad and cry you're trying to get them to feel um you know outrage and become angry and comedy is really just about making them feel surprise and joy and then laugh mm -hmm. you know yeah. or or the, i mean there's different ways we laugh right we laugh because we're feeling surprised and joyful we laugh because we're feeling uh uncomfortable and shocked 
So, you know, it depends on how you want to how you want to make someone laugh. And there are all different ways to do it, but it's always an emotional response. Yeah. Um, and I got another question for Legend of Bonefish, and then we'll we'll probably move <laughs> on to a little bit of voice acting. Um, all right. Something so, more current. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so there, there's one one skit called Whale Boy on there. Yeah. And I know there's there's you had to put uh, so many things on just to give off the impression that you're a whale. Like, how did you guys pull that off? Because I'm I'm just I'm just kind of wondering what went into that one. All right. Well, so first of all, I'm wearing a T-shirt that I am sticking my elbows through the armholes mm-hmm. uh, so that I can flap them around like flippers. And so my hands are just really like in front of my chest. And I, like if you watch it, you can actually <laughs> see my arms under my shirt. Like it's stupid. Um, because we didn't try to mask that at all because we didn't feel like that was necessary. Yeah, and then we, just did, <laughs> then we just did. Then we just did. I put. I popped the lenses out of some sunglasses, some just cheap plastic sunglasses, and kind of put them in my eye sockets, and then put a very tight piece of uh, stocking, like hosiery, over my head, and then onto that we applied thick white and black makeup um, to make me look like an orca, and then googly eyes. Okay, it kind of looked like you had something that was. Wait, what was the blown up part? Or was just there a stocking, like a like a. Is that what you're talking about? Um, it, well, it just kind of looked like your uh, the T-shirt was inflated some of the time. Uh, I think I think it's just because I'm folding my arms underneath it. Really, I think it's just sort of, and I'm hunching, right? So I'm kind of okay. Pushing my, I'm pushing myself. It's a physicality thing, really, more than a yeah. There's nothing nothing ballooning about me. Okay, <laughs> as far as I can recall. Although it's possible they put me in some kind of fat suit or something underneath the shirt i can't remember okay we had all sorts of stuff in our tickle trunk so you never know there might have been <laughs> put on a i can't remember that yeah lots of experimenting i assume <laughs> yeah did yeah. anything come from those short films like as in job wise uh in the acting world uh, did you put any of them forward as i guess auditions maybe or show or uh, film festivals i think yeah, no, you would never use them as a, an audition necessarily, but uh, but we definitely um, submitted a couple of them to, I can't remember what film festival, but we submitted them to something, and Nora Dunn from Saturday Night Live picked The Legend of Bonefish, the sketch you mentioned earlier, as one of her favorites from that uh, round, or and I think we... I, I don't know if we, I don't think we got a bottle of wine or anything for it, but I think we just got a, <laughs> we got a piece of paper, I think, that said Nora Dunn like that. Said well so, done. You <laughs> Pat on the back. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Uh, and then the, the thing is, you never know in this business, like you never know what thing is going to lead to what other thing. Right. Because mm-hmm. you never know who sees what you do and and whether or not they remember it when they meet you or, you know, like <laughs> you never know. So, but sometimes it's a feeling, I think sometimes you, you know somebody sees something that you do and they liked you in it. And then five years later they meet you at an audition and, and think I like this guy, but I don't know why I'm going to use them. <laughs> so you don't know. You never know. Okay. I see. Yeah. So another question that I was curious of my levels are off the charts and I hate it. I don't know how to help you with that from here, but uh, thank no. you for asking. <laughs> yeah, <it's> Skype, <laughs> Skype is like, it's adjusting my mic automatically. We just brought you I... on here for a tutorial on how to fix our mics. That's <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> um, so uh, since you've, you've got some experience both on uh, as a physical actor and as a, a voice actor, I was kind of curious of um, like how different it is between uh, the projects that you've been on. Uh, for me, it, acting is acting is acting, right? Like whether you're on a stage, on camera, or behind a microphone, the the fundamental process is the same because what you're doing is uh, taking a scene and figuring out how to break that scene down in a way that you can perform it and then trying to um, connect with a scene partner and make it work you know and make an audience respond emotionally uh on a stage you're using your entire body to do that uh on a camera you're primarily using your eyes 
and in a voiceover situation, you're primarily using your voice as the tool. So you're just sort of focusing the performance in a different way, but ultimately the 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 act of developing a performance, developing a character, and kind of pushing it forward for a performance is is kind of the same no matter what you're doing. There are different elements, obviously, to to working in voice. Like something I like about working in voice is that you get to in a in a prelay session, like in My Little Pony or Littlest Pet Shop, what one of those kinds of shows. Um, the whole cast is sitting or standing around in a horseshoe, and you're kind of talking to each other and running it like a almost theatrically and I kind of like that whereas on camera you're you're sort of doing piece after piece after piece and you're kind of doing it over and over and over again and then over and over and over again from a different angle and uh, <laughs> so there's a there's a really different um, there's a different kind of repetition that happens in voice you do something two or three times and you can make two or three different offers and on camera you have to figure out how to make different offers that also cut yeah. Which is weird, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you want to make good offers. You want to say, well, what about this? What about that? But at the same time, you know, if they got you in the wide shot doing one thing and then you do something radically different in the close up, then that's sort of useless. So you're trying to balance that kind of thing out. And on stage, of course, everything is everything happens once and it happens now. And so that's a thrill. So, you know, each thing is different and each thing has something appealing to it. OK. Um, and when it comes to to voice acting, uh, what are some of your favorite warm ups, and and what do you do differently depending on what you have to do with your voice, like a high voice versus a deep voice, singing or talking? Because I noticed that you have a couple of uh, performer <laughs> credits on both My Little Pony and Littlest Pet Shop, so uh, mm-hmm. kind of curious on that. Uh, I, t- I mean, typically, if you know, I, my voice is. I, you know, I keep my voice pretty warm by and large. You know, I use it every day and I try to keep it, uh, you know, oiled and working. But uh, tongue twisters, you know, uh, are really great to keep the embouchure uh, stretched. So you're doing, you know, red leather, yellow leather five times fast or which wristwatches or Swiss wristwatches five times fast or those kinds of things to keep it oh kind of God. keep your enunciation <laughs> moving. Uh, well, you can. You just have to practice. I, I know. That's um, what I mean. <laughs> I couldn't do it now. <laughs> I'm like, going to try. Uh, uh, concentrating on breathing is important, making sure you're taking a good diaphragmatic breath and uh, and keeping your you know, your your jaw loose. Because what you're doing something high is not about sort of stretching your neck up and doing something low is not about tucking your chin in. You can hear that on the microphone if I'm tucking my chin in. It, it compresses the throat. Uh, in a way which is weird whereas if I want to go low I can just drop my jaw and it'll come out low without me having to push or stress or or create any kind of strain as long as the breath is proper because if you're taking this big sort of massive chest breath where you're you know inflating your entire shoulder region you're actually tensing up your throat and that's going to make things a lot more difficult for you yeah it does just tend to close off the airways (laughs) yeah Breathing, yeah. So you have to figure out how to breathe that keeps your airways open. So, you know, breathing and tongue twisters are kind of the, the big thing. Um, and then some stretching. Stretching and mindfulness is important, interestingly enough. Yes. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, when, you're, when you're doing your voices, how do you kind of ex- explore and, and figure out what a character will sound like. Like, how, how do you go about finding the different voices that you do? I mean, I think that's a bit different depending on uh, depending on the, the ask. Uh, I think that... Um, I think that a lot of what I do in my sort of daily practice is about trying to push my voice into a new place to figure out what else it can do. And that comes from a number of different sources. Sometimes I just... I catch my face in the mirror making a weird face and I'll go like, oh, what does that weird face sound like? You know, and I'll start to talk in the weird voice and then I'll push on that and try and figure out, well, what is that character like? What is that? You know, try and deepen it. Sometimes I'll see somebody walking down the street and I'll wonder, I'll think, well, what do they sound like? And I'll try and do their voice of them, what I think they might sound like, even though I'm sure I'm way off. It doesn't matter. It's about me that practicing. That's a really good game. <laughs> I got to try that sometime. Oh, it's super, super good, super fun. Uh, 
a lot of it is about listening and imitating, right? Like I find it incredibly difficult to listen to somebody speaking in an accent, for instance, and then not immediately try to do that accent, yeah. however oh, yeah. badly. Is that a hint, hint? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, is that a hidden hint? You know, I sort of like to go into what you're doing. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but, you know, I just kind of listen and go. And it doesn't matter if it's good, doesn't matter if it's bad, because it's what what's happening in my instrument is that I'm practicing going into this thing and I'm practicing leaning into that. And then I start to go, well, what's the sky like? And it's not you anymore, it's me. And I've gotten Scotland. Oh, it's interesting. I've gone further north than I expected. You know, and then you, you just kind of <laughs> let it lead you and let the voice kind of play into what uh, what it wants to do. Um, because it's just you in, in your room at your mic, right? Uh, yeah. But then when you get an audition breakdown, it's like it's going to kind of lead you and say, well, for Big Macintosh, for instance, it's like, well, he's this kind of slow talking, low talking uh you know, Southerner, he's Applejack's brother. So you, you, there's a lot of kind of limiting factors that you're like, well, okay, well, Applejack sounds like this. So I've got to go, kind of go into this pocket a little bit and slow talking. So I'll slow it down a little bit. But you got to be careful going slow in animation because animation is so fast paced that how do you go slow and keep it entertaining? How do you go slow and keep it moving at the same time? And so you you kind of go fake slow. You know, you kind of let it linger, even though you're actually moving quick. Like, I'm not actually talking that slowly. I'm just, you know, just kind of You, you kind of get the illusion that you bouncing are. Bouncing through it in a yeah. slow way, you know. So, because uh, if it actually goes too slow, then it immediately dies. The energy of it all just falls apart. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes you don't have a lot of time either. Like, sometimes you get an audition, which is, you know, literally like, uh, okay, here's the part. What have you got? Uh, and a lot of the jobs I did on Littlest Pet Shop, I think I ended up doing about 70 voices on Littlest Pet Shop over four years. Uh, and a lot of the jobs I got on that show were basically, uh, what do you got? Like, in this episode, we have X, what do you, and we think you could do it. What, what do you have? And so you're standing at the microphone in front of the cast going, uh, something like this? And they go, yeah, okay, that's great. And you're like, okay. <laughs> We're, we're doing this guy now. <laughs> and it's like literally no time to think. So part okay. of it is about like, so what I'm trying to get at is that sort of practice of like pushing the voice into the weird places and finding myself in Scotland and all those other things prepares me for, okay, we've got a Scotsman today. Can you do it? And you're like, oh, yes, I can. Cause I was just doing it the other day. I've, you know, I've learned that. Um, so you kind of, by by keeping yourself exploring and keeping yourself in practice at home, you kind of prepare yourself for the fast pace of uh, of the suggestive world of the room, you know, which is interesting. Yeah, and uh, do you kind of name your voices as you come up with them, or do you just kind of use them whenever they're needed? <laughs> yeah, I know there's a... I mean, I think there's wisdom in naming your voices. I find that I... Uh, if I know that I'm going to need to recall that one specifically, I'll name it. Um, you know, when I was making my demo, for instance, I made sure that I named my voices in my demo so that I could recall them because, I, you know, you're, you're coming up with them at home and then you're bringing them to a studio and then you're recording it there. And so you're trying to, you're trying to give yourself a, a clue to what the voice is without having a, a reference in your, in your headphones. Uh, but going into the studio to do a show, they've, you know, they record the first time you do it or they record your audition. And so you've got the reference in your cans and they can say, um, OK, Peter, we're going to do Littlest Pet Shop season five after five years of not doing it. Here's your character, Sunil. Here's what he sounded like. And it'll play in my ears and I can be like, oh, OK, yeah, I, I, I know where that lives in my voice, in my throat. So, it, you know, then you can kind of recreate it. Yeah, I, I kind of have um, like key phrases that I remember for some of the voices like. Um, yeah, for Ludi, it's, are... it's turtle. Or um, there's others that are you know, like a worried guy. I forget what we named him, but I have a name for it. Where he's just kind of, oh, hey, everything's going well. You know? Yeah. So I think. And I and I think that that's kind of what I do too, right? Like a lot of phrases are particularly good for accents for me as well, because in in an like. Um, I did a few auditions. I never got a job on it, unfortunately, but I did a few auditions for the show Fargo, which was shot nearby. Uh, and trying to master that Minnesotan, North Dakotan accent, I came across the phrase, I got a problem, there's nobody home, because the O sounds are so different in got and prob and 
nobody home, right? You've got those big round O's in the second words and the, and the really flat O's in the first ones. And so every time I had an audition for Fargo, I was like, okay, I would just sit there going, I got a problem. There's nobody home. I got a problem. There's nobody home ahead of the audition. Oh, so that when I would go into the audition, I'd, I'd sort of hit the accent, right? You know, <laughs> do, do, do you want to punch in the throat as my one for getting into sort of, you know, lower, lower class England, you know? Oh, yeah, you don't know that one. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, do you want to punch... <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a there's a swear word in it usually, but I I don't know how <laughs> vulgar I can go with you guys here. Oh, it's fine. The, this podcast is yeah. We we don't mind if there's swearing yeah. in this. <laughs> 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 okay, good to know. Good to know yeah. for future reference. <laughs> yeah, probably should have said that at the start of the podcast. <laughs> Would have been better. Um, have you guys seen that video? Uh, is it Tom Kenny that did it uh, on YouTube where he was given images of cartoon characters he'd never seen before, and he had to give a voice for them. Have you ever oh, done no, something I haven't. like that before? Oh, you no, haven't? Oh, I'll so, have to send you. I, oh, I really? Yeah, I'd like to see that. Was, yeah, you should, because um, I can't remember what channel it was from now, but I remember it popping in my uh, feed just probably just a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, he was given, obviously gave a bit of demonstration of how he prepares his voice, but then he went into a different imi- uh, cartoon character um, for the whole video, and he would give a different voice for each one and explain why he came up with that particular voice, you know, with... With the facial expression yeah. the character was giving and the the way it stood, the, obviously the build of the character. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that was I mean, like I, a fun I, video. Go on, sorry. I definitely, I definitely, you know, that, that is how you approach, uh, if you get an image, that's definitely how you approach it, right? Like if you get a, mm. you, you get a, a big nose buck tooth character, I might put it like, uh, uh, and I go into there with it, you know, just based on the image that came into my head right now. But sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to sometimes it's fun to go against type too, right? Like I often like to, yeah, I often like to try to do like a, a little a little voice like that for like a really big beefy guy, and sometimes that really works, you know. Yeah, and you want to fight? <laughs> yeah, you want to fight? Yeah, come on. You know, I think that's really fun to do. So, you should definitely look to um, maybe do some videos on that, <laughs> and then start a YouTube yeah, channel might, doing that. Yeah, it might, might be a good that, idea. Who knows? It actually might be. Yeah, you never know. Because <laughs> I mean, that video seemed to take off, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Be a, be a fun exercise. Yeah. Um, so in My Little Pony, there are some characters, uh, some character actors like Tara Strong, Ashley Ball, Tabitha St. Tabitha Germain, and others. But there's also singing voices for characters yeah. uh, that are performed by like uh, Rebecca Schoichet or uh, Shannon Chan Kent. So um, I was kind of curious because you, uh, of course, have some uh, roles as a performer for My Little Pony. Um do you know why Hasbro may have decided to do that for some characters, but not others? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think it's Hasbro's decision as much as it was probably uh, DHX's decision. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't really know why a lot of those choices were made. I think, I think a lot of those choices probably were made by Daniel Ingram, um, and between him and and the. Uh, and the animation directors just trying to make sure that the sound was consistent. The sound was right. Um, I know like I sang all of big Macintosh's singing, which wasn't a whole lot, but that was, they just used me. And in littlest pet shop, I sang for Sunil, but I also know that Nicole Oliver who played Zoe, who was a pop star, didn't sing for Zoe. So I, I don't know how that side of it yeah, <laughs> it really works. You know, yeah, like the it's, kind of thing that comes it's just whatever, mind. It, this whatever casting thinks is is the best sound, you know. Yeah, the the thing that kind of came into mind for me was maybe it's just to ensure that the voice actors are always kind of not overworking their voice. Um, no, I don't think I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think no. they they're quite content to overwork us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, quite content. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's I think it's really about it's about the the product itself, right? Like sometimes when people, you know, you know, like if you're getting into a character and then this character has to sing, some people kind of, oh, well, I can talk it, no problem. But but when they sing, it kind of goes somewhere different. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, singing is a, is a slightly different uh, animal. So, uh, I think sometimes the the recast happens just because they feel like the voice is a little bit off when the person is singing. Sometimes I think sometimes I think it's political too. Sometimes I think that the people that are casting, uh, and I don't, I, you know, I can't speak to whether or not this happened on ponies, but 
um, sometimes I think the the people doing the the music recording and the people doing the acting recording have different ideas about what they want to get out of a character and are comfortable working with different people, and so they just bring in different people to do it because they they kind of work parallel. Okay. Yeah, does make sense. Interesting, right? Yes, it's a, it's very interesting <laughs> to think. Of, it's not you know, like those kind of decisions and why they'd be. Yeah, um. it's it's uh, <clears throat> it's a lot less. I mean, the voice actors really like we're such a small part of the process, really, when it comes down to it, right? Like a an episode gets pitched, uh, and then it gets written, and that's going to take maybe six months, right? And then it's going to get storyboarded and uh, the directors are going to get at it and try and figure out what, you know, can they, do they need notes on it? Do they need to move it around? And that's going to take another couple of months. And then we come in for four hours and record it. And then the animators take over for another year. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> so we're such a small, but, but, but there's so much focus on, on what we do, right? Because it, our our part of the process is to help really make the thing be alive enough for the animator to animate. But it's such a, like for us, it's like we get a script on a Wednesday and we record on a Friday and and then we don't think about it again for until it comes out and people start asking us questions about it. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you kind of... For, the, for the, everybody else on the crew, it's the, this sort of ongoing animal, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, do you do you watch a lot of the the things that you've been in? Uh, up to a point, I don't watch everything, but I do think that I, I mean I think it's interesting. You know, different different actors have a different idea of it. But for me, it's like uh, my my performance is a product, and so I feel like I, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, I have. Uh, a vested interest in seeing how my product is behaving in the marketplace, you know? So it, it matters to me as an entrepreneur to look at uh, the performance that my actor gave and then to be able to give him notes and to be able to say, well, you see here when you did this, you could have done that instead. Um, whereas I know there are other actors out there who are like, I know Adam Driver, for instance, who is, you know, much bigger and more famous than I am, but I know he can't stand watching himself. And yeah. I, I'm baffled by that. But, you know, good for him. Off you go. You do you. You're clearly doing something right. <laughs> you <know>? yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I hear that a lot about um, uh, quite a few actors. Is not is Johnny Depp a similar thing? I'm sure he walked out of um, I'm not, I'm a not talk sure. show or something if they played a clip. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of it off the top of my head now. But um, I, no I noticed that a lot uh, with actors that, that um, they struggle to watch watch themselves back on screen which um, I was similar at one point until I realized that I'm going to have to just so I can take my own notes. And then when I yeah. started making YouTube videos and stuff, I was like, it, it's the only way I can actually learn from it. Because, I, I, you know, when you hear it back and, y yeah, you can just you can learn so much from it. Um, so, But the more I've done it now, the more it's, it's just kind of normal to me now. You know, it's, I remember yeah. 10 years ago, if I'd have told myself that, no, you're going to have to watch yourself back and, and take notes. I'd have been like, "What? Are you crazy?" Yeah, and, yeah. It's just it's interesting how well, people change. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's I think that's a terrific skill because I think the ability to be able to. I mean, I I like to say it like this: like you need to learn how to listen to your performance or watch your performance and not immediately think, "God, I'm fat." Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because that's not what anyone else is looking at. Right. People are looking at. You know, are are they engaged with the character? Are they entertained by the voice? Are they are they laughing? Are they you know like those are the things that are necessary critiques. But your critique of your own insecurity is is not helping you. You know, and it doesn't help you in your day to day life, and it doesn't help you professionally. So stop. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's it. <laughs> End of story. Yeah, I've I've kind of noticed. Um, Every now and again with my YouTube videos, I'll look back and and uh, see the kid that was in front of his webcam in a messy room. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. And, and the transition to, to, day, to today. And even now, I, I still look back at some of the newer videos and I'm like, oh, that could be improved. I could fix that. That's, I, I mean, I can make it better this way. 
Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, like I, nice. I, I remember making my my voiceover demo. It was on quite a number of years ago now. I made my voiceover demo my, that I still use. But every now and then I'll listen back to it, and um, it's not great. But I remember being so proud of it at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, every time I hear it now, I'm like, ah, I gotta make a new one. But I'm still getting, <laughs> I'm still getting booked off it. So you know, I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's Can't working complain. for somebody. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, with with all of the projects that you've worked on, uh, is there anything that like you the most memorable moment that you've had throughout all of the years? Uh, I mean, there's always there are a number of memorable moments. Always, you know, because I do, you know, I get to work with a lot of people that I admire and that I've I've grown up with. Um, uh, I I worked on uh, Terry Gilliam's movie, The Imaginary of Dr. Parnassus. I had a small role, just a one-liner basically on that one, but I would have done anything. I would have moved a, a bucket of trash on that movie because <laughs> um, because I grew up a, a terrific fan of Brazil and the adventures of Baron Munchausen and Time Bandits and uh, 12 Monkeys and, you know, his his entire Fisher King, etc. You know, all those movies were um, my favorites. And, uh, and he's the only artist that I said to my agent when I came on with my camera agent and said, if, if Terry Gilliam ever works in this city, I want to be in that movie. And uh, sure enough, I managed to do that. Um, and so that was a, a, a thrill, you know, to be able to it, really the moment for me was, you know, uh, to be able to stand there between takes and just have a chat with Terry Gilliam about a shot from uh, Adventures of Baron Munchausen. And why he chose to do it the way he did it. And, you know, just an easy, idle chat that came out of it came out of like looking at a piece of technology that we had for the camera called the Techno Crane. And he started talking about, yeah, I was supposed to have this on Munchausen for for a shot. And I'm like, was it the shot of this? He's like, yes, it was a shot of that. But then and then we just, you know, and it's just like, oh, now I'm <laughs> I'm talking with like my cinematic hero <laughs> about yeah. one of my favorite shots from one of my favorite movies, you know, you just kind of go, yeah, no, this is all right. This is cool. No problem. Yeah, hold, it's okay. Hold back. I can do this. It's great. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, you get other, you know, <laughs> if you don't mind the swearing, you get other moments like on, from that same set and it's a different kind of memory, but a different kind of story. It's like when you, when you get to the set in the first place, you get together for what's called a blocking, right? Which is where they decide where you're going to move and, and everything else. Um, yeah. And, uh, but we were, we were shooting in a big blue room, basically, right? So Terry's blocking was essentially, uh, so these characters are going to come down here, and then they're going to come past you, and then that character's going to come up from over there, and he's going to be bringing a whole desert with them, and it's going to look amazing. At least that's what they tell me. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> this is all going to happen in post, right? Yeah, um, very in depth. <laughs> but but uh, we're standing around, and it's it's me and and Michael Johnson, who's playing my paramedic number two. I was paramedic number one. You know, great names. Um, it was Lily Cole and Andrew Garfield and um, uh, Colin Farrell and Christopher Plummer and Terry Gilliam. And uh, we all get brought over, and uh, the first AD comes up and introduces himself, and then introduces me to Terry and Colin and Andrew and Lily and Michael and I already knew each other. And then by the time I got around to Christopher Plummer, I'm all ready to shake Christopher Plummer's hand, and Plummer doesn't care. He's already like talking to Terry about how he wants to do this and how he wants to do that. And I kind of stand there with my hand, getting you know, you know that high five that you don't get hit, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, and I sort of look down at my hand and then drop it and shrug and look up. And Colin Farrell is looking at me. He goes, "Oh, you don't want to meet him anyway. He's a cunt." <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right. Oh, that's Thank a you, nice Colin idea. Farrell. Yeah, uh... welcome, welcome to the set. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's um, like, and I didn't really have any kind of bond with Colin Farrell. Like, that's basically the only thing he ever said to me. But, like, you know, yeah. you're sitting there going, well, all right. <laughs> this is the world we live in, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you're currently working on um, a podcast, I believe it was, The Voyage of the Overwell. It's called The Voyage of the Wifferfall. But it does Wifferfall. look like, okay. it does look like Overwall. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was uh, I was doing a, a, a gig with a friend of mine last Christmas or so, a year ago, and a South African guy, he owns a studio, and he says to me after the thing, he's like, hey, Peter, um, do, you, uh, do you know podcasts? I'm like, yeah, I know podcasts. He's like, do, do you think you could do a radio play as a podcast? I'm like, yeah, I think you could do that. And he's like, because I've got this studio, you know, and I thought we could do a radio play as a podcast just for fun. I'm like, yeah, okay, that sounds like we could do that. He's like, well, you know, maybe we could write a few things together. I don't know. And I just kind of went away from that conversation, and I don't know what happened, but I just wrote 13 episodes of this thing with like in four weeks. And um, we just banged it out, and then I took it back to him, and he read it and went, yeah, no, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, let's cast it and do it. <laughs> and so we cast it, and we did it. <laughs> Uh, And my only rules writing it were I want it to be stupid and I want every episode to be stupider than the last episode and I don't really want to rewrite it more than once or twice. Uh, Yeah, and I just wanted to do it and get it done. I don't don't care. (laughs) uh, As long as I'm entertaining myself, I'm fine. And uh, so that's what we recorded. Uh, And it's uh, I think it's true to that. It's about 16th century Dutch explorers who uh, sail on a boat called the Wifferfall, which translates to bland spring but i just liked that it looked like the word over wall and they uh they go seeking the edge of the earth Mm. Uh, i play i play christopher columbus okay okay who is who is their nemesis (laughs) ah (laughs) what what does he uh sound like he sounds like this which i'm trying to go back as far from my mic as i can (laughs) so loud (laughs) he's a I'm the face of the other way, and hopefully, no, I can see now. I'm now I'm looking at my uh, my <laughs> recording, and I can see it's just blasting. So I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try to do it quietly, but even then, I can hear it. I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear oh, it man. peaking. He's a ridiculous character. When I'm, when, I'm, like when we record the podcast, we really like it's the studio and I, like the space I'm in right now is essentially a closet. Um, <laughs> but when we're in the studio, uh, we're using the, uh, the same mic that I have here, basically, but we're putting it in the middle of the room and then everybody just holds their scripts and we perform it. And that's it. We do go, we go all the way through it once, some notes, go all the way through it twice and that's it. Mm. And uh, yeah. Uh, so if you want to sound like you're close up and intimate with someone, you come in on the mic. And if you want to sound like you're far away, you stand over by the wall and you call to them. And that's that's how we get our sound dynamic, because the mic just picks up where you are in the space. So Columbus is always by the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> so uh, that does seem pretty fun. Um, you can actually find it on Twitter. Uh, it's uploaded to podcasts on Apple, Spotify, other places. Um, so yeah, I'll you... give you. The, I'll spell out the Twitter handle because otherwise you'll never find it. It's at <laughs> o at o e v e r w a l, Wifferfall, yes. clearly. Nice. And if you can't <laughs> find it and you're having trouble and you really really want to find me on Twitter at actor Peter New, and I will tell you because I love to talk to people on Twitter. Yes. I will tell you uh, where to find it. Yes, it was very <laughs> easy to get a hold of you. Just to hop on Twitter and message you, and bam. Bam! You're right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of the beauty of Twitter, right? Like that is yeah. you get to kind of, you know, I've ended up in conversations with, again, it's the same kind of thing, right? Now I can be on a set talking to Terry Gilliam 10 years ago, but now I can just, you know, I, I've gone back and forth with Mark Hamill. I've gone mm. back and forth with, you know, I don't know. It's crazy. Remember. People. Ricky <laughs> Gervais. Yeah. Oh, Ricky Gervais, yeah. He's always on Twitter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and you're also working on uh, a hindsight project for 2020. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, this is amazing, you guys. It's going to blow your minds. Oh, uh, I just I'm thought, ready. I thought, okay, so in the 24-hour clock, 8.20 p.m. is 2020. And I thought at 8.20 p.m. every night, all year, I'm just going to take a picture of whatever I'm looking at when my little alarm goes off and then put it on Instagram and that's it. Hindsight project, 2020, 2020 (laughs) in 2020. (laughs) Uh, What what have you captured so far? (laughs) Um, I've taken a picture of some vegetables, 
taken a couple of pictures of my dog. Uh, I took a picture of my, my I was drinking a Romulan ale last night at the Stormcrow Ale House or the tavern. I can't remember which is which. Um, and uh, so I took a picture of that. And uh, I don't know. It's only been, I've only had nine pictures. You have to go to my Instagram, <laughs> at Peter New. <laughs> yeah, let's go, yeah. go there to see some of, the, <laughs> some of the lovely things he's taken a picture of. Um, by the time this podcast goes live, he's bound to have more pictures than he. I will. Well, I'm going to have another one. In uh, my first few, I was in Columbus, Ohio, when over the New Year. So my first few were at 8:20 Eastern, uh, but now I'm on the Pacific Coast in Vancouver. So now they're all at 8:20 Pacific. So if I travel in the year, then it'll be you know, it'll happen at different times. But period in general, you can find a new one every night at 8:20 Pacific. Mm, all righty. Um, are you going to any events this year? Yeah, I can tell you about two of them. I'm going to be at BabsCon in San Francisco in April, and I'm going to and I'm going to go to. I will be on the Sea Bronies Hawaiian cruise in September. Oh, nice! Which honestly, like, that's gonna be fun. Yeah, it's a cruise. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a, a con. It's a ten day cruise. To Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, from <laughs> from Vancouver. So you get to come here to Vancouver where we record My Little Pony. If you're a big My Little Pony fan, we can, there's a, like, I think there'll probably be a dinner the night before or something. We can hang out and chat then. And then we get on a boat and go to Seattle, day in Seattle. Then we're at sea and then we get to Hawaii and then it's, you know, drinking Kona coffee and going to the Dole Plantation and <laughs> volcanoes and uh, snorkeling and what uh, fun. Hawaii skirt, uh, hula yeah, skirts. Yeah, hula skirts. Hula skirts and, <laughs> yeah, eating, eating poi and getting laid. Hey. <laughs> yeah. hey oh. All Hey-o. of my comedy is at least this dumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, you, uh, since you work with a lot of the um, show guests that are at conventions like Sea mm-hmm. Brony Cruise or BabsCon or I assume you've been to BronyCon too. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do you guys kind of hang out while you're at these events as well? We, I, I think that's mostly where we hang out, to be honest with you. I think the cons have been really great for us as a community uh, because, you know, like I, the, the show gets written in L.A., uh, and I never would have met any of the writers if it weren't for these conventions. And I've developed friendships with uh, many of the writers now. And uh, uh, some of the actors I don't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have worked with, right? Because I only go in to do the episodes that I'm in, and some of the actors are in other episodes that I'm not in. And I may not necessarily have met them if not for the, the con. Uh, certainly the people that make the comics, I, you know, I developed a great friendship with Jen Blake and uh, and she and I were on the last Brony cruise together, which is why I know it's going to be a good time. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I never would have met any of these people. And, and that's exciting for me, you know, and I think exciting for all of us that we've managed to. Uh, it, it's so rare in a show like this, which is written in L.A. and recorded in Vancouver and, you know, produced in Rhode Island and 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 a lot of it is you know much of it's animated here but then some other animation happens elsewhere and uh and then there's the sort of comic community and then the fan community and like the opportunity for all of us to kind of come together in celebration of it is is kind of remarkable and that doesn't normally happen yeah yeah have you had a chance to go to any of the conventions overseas because I know there's a couple yeah. of events over there <laughs> Yeah, I've been uh, I, I I've been to cons in uh, Germany and uh, the UK and the Netherlands and Australia, and otherwise uh, just all over the US. But that's been awesome, you know. Oh yeah, you you get to travel the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And meet a bunch of people. Yeah, and that's you know that's something I always wanted for my acting career too is to to tr- travel in it. You know, I love to travel so. The, uh, the first opportunity I ever had to travel for acting was I got to just shoot. Uh, I shot a commercial for uh, Saskatchewan Casino in uh, the city of Regina. And so I got to fly to Regina and pretend to be Haas from Bonanza and sit on the back of a horse. And they actually made a cardboard cutout of me and put it in the casino. I never saw it. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, so you get, to, you get to do these ridiculous things. I flew to Kamloops to shoot Lost Treasure of the Grand Canyon. That was exotic. Um, I, flew to, I flew to Uganda to teach. Ooh. Uh, that was interesting. And um, oh, What was it you taught? Acting. Acting. Okay, that sounds I was, about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. But that was, you know, again, on, that was on the recommendation of some friends of mine that were, uh, at the time, they were producing Mad Men. So that was a pretty nice recommendation to get. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite place to have gone? In general or for for work? Um, in general. Paris. Paris, okay. What what yeah. what brought you to Paris? I first went to Paris with, on a family vacation when I was a teenager and uh I went back uh after Galicon um in 2013. And now it's been too long again, and I gotta go back. But I, I just adore it. There. <laughs> yes, I'm a you Frank- must be at Paris. <laughs> I'm a I'm a francophile. I'm a ridiculous francophile. I, I speak a little bit, but uh, I I'm crazy for French food, and I'm crazy for French wine, and I'm I love the city and the and the culture, and I I don't I'm, I don't object to the Gaelic shrug. I like I I understand it, you know. Like <laughs> I sort of feel like. Uh, Paris is kind of like New York in a certain way and that like as as long as you're not they just don't suffer fools you know and it's I don't think it's a I don't think there's a rudeness to it I just think there's a we're happy to help you as long as you're trying but if you're being a nitwit then come on don't waste my time <laughs> um and then but, that I mean was... I, I, that's such a quick answer too but I now I'm sort of filling my head with all these other places I've been and places I haven't gone. I'd love to go to the Galapagos. If there's a BronyCon in the Galapagos Islands, someone please set that up. I, yes. I feel like that <laughs> might, hint in there. might yeah. be a long <laughs> shot. I don't know, but I would love to go there. <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah. He wants, he wants yeah. to go there. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it happen, sea turtles. Yes. <laughs> um, so that was uh, all of the questions that I could think of. Uh, Jamie, did you have any other questions you thought might be worth asking? Um, not necessarily questions, but I could bring up, uh, I do want to bring up the, uh, hindsight projects again, because I do actually like that idea, and I've, well, there's not really much I have to say to it, it's just one thing I want to say is that that is something I've always probably wanted to do, you know, where that either taking a picture of something every day for an entire year, or doing something, um, that fits a theme, because, um... There was a YouTuber called Jax Films who did something last year in 2019, which mm-hmm. came from a joke because um, there was this running trend about uh, when you you know people have um, people who have don't have iPhones and they have Android phones instead are poor. That that's kind of it was a running <laughs> joke, and so obviously Twitter <laughs> told people that because yeah. uh, there's that thing at the b- below that goes twitter for iphone or twitter for android so anytime um someone tweeted with it on an android twitter would tell them it's twitter for android and people would just kind of fill the comments saying twitter for android or, or just start obviously saying a, a random joke about how they don't have an iphone and so he decided to tweet out twitter for android because he had an android phone um and then screenshot it and then the next day he would um tweeted at, uh, he would quote that tweet and tweet again twitter for android and then screenshot it again and then just keep doing it <laughs> for every single day so yeah. we just make this really long screenshot of, yeah. of all the tweets he had made in the space of a year and then what i would like to at the very he's just released a video now just a, a last week of all the tweets he did throughout the whole year of that twitter for android and turned it into a song that's uh, great. Which I That's felt, great. Yeah, I so. I admire that. I admire that sort of conviction to a joke and uh, and I <laughs> I have you ever have you ever watched Paul Rudd on the Conan O'Brien show? I haven't. Uh, what's I that? think do yourself a favor and just go ahead and Google um, Paul Rudd on Conan O'Brien and find the video that is exposing the fact that. Over however many years he's gone on the Conan O'Brien show, he always uses the same clip. <laughs> it's, All right. It's it's one yes. of those things that like after you see it, you'll see it once and you'll be like, oh, OK, I get it. And then the OK, I get it moment, you'll feel like this is going to become tiresome. But keep watching because it becomes hilarious. <laughs> that he just like it's so relentless. 
And I love that kind of I love relentlessness as a as a as a as a as an open door into comedy. Yeah, my my personal favorite stuff about comedy is when you you put so much effort into one simple joke that it becomes ridiculous. Yeah. Um I think that's that's what I probably that, when someone puts so much effort into something so stupid, it becomes um it, it, it's so much more f- it, it's much funnier yeah. there's a there's a youtube channel i keep bringing up youtube but that it's my home so i <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's where enough. i find most things um there, there's another youtube channel called uh, lasagna cat and it disappeared it, it uploaded strange um live action versions of uh the three panel comic strips of garfield oh fantastic uh, from the like the 80s uh, yeah and just and 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 it, it doesn't really do much. It literally just reenacts it, the three panels, and then finishes. And then that's about it. That's and then they kind disappeared. Of fantastic. <laughs> yeah, they disappeared yeah. <laughs> for nine years. And then they came back. And the first video they uploaded was an hour long video of just a guy talking about um, the intelligence of the very first three panel comic strip of Garfield. And I think it was um, <laughs> all, all the panels comic. Relentless. Uh, the, yeah, it was brilliant, and I think it's I think brilliant. the first strip was um, it was John reaching out for a pipe, uh, and then he goes, "Now where could my pipe be?" And it turns out Garfield smoking it, and he spent an entire hour comparing it to Socrates and all the the Greek mythology and That's and amazing. Shakespeare, and it was just it was brilliant, and it it. it it looked like it was done all in one take, but there was like slight tweaks, you know, I guess like Birdman and any other that looks like it's a one shot. There's like slight fade ins that transition. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the fact that it looks like it's all just one take and it's speaking for an hour. And then they uploaded nine more videos of them just reenacting comic strips. And they spent obviously nine years putting all this together just for a joke. <laughs> the amount <laughs> yeah. of effort that they put that, into the, that. That commitment I, is so great. That commitment yeah. is great. Uh, That's what makes it we so did funny. A, what, we did a comedy sketch. I, after Bonefish, I was in a duo called Long Hard Comedy Rocket with one of the mm-hmm. guys from Bonefish, just the two of us. Oh. And we did a sketch called The Creature from Dimension 26, which uh, was, I think it was around eight minutes long, and it existed solely for the purpose of getting us to a place where the audience would sit there and watch us eat a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Like that was the joke was that we would eat we oh. would just s- s- stop and just eat a hot dog and, and we would eat that <laughs> hot dog for like a minute and a half of that eight minutes and they would laugh at it That's uh, you know brilliant. Yeah. and that like and the and the rest of the sketches is just insane like it's this insipid repeating like mad scientist looking for a creature like it's got nothing to do with eating a hot dog but you sort of you know you create this architecture where they're like what the hell is happening? What am I looking at? <laughs> you know, like so that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, I think that's uh all I obviously wanted to bring up. Um and you you've d- gone through all your questions, haven't you, Eric? Ah, uh, yes. Fabulous. All right. Well, I think we'll I, bring it to a close then. I have one I have one to... more thing I would love to to pitch and just to let everybody know to look out for it, and that is that uh I'm uh, one of my the guy that actually d- wrote and directed the Whale Boy sketch. Uh, has written a feature film that he is directing uh, next month, starring me. It's called Time Helmet, and it is about uh, a guy who invents a helmet that can transmit you backwards into the previous. You know, you got to create two helmets in two different times, and you can transmit your consciousness back in time to the previous helmet. Oh! Uh, so he comes. He comes back in time from the future to commit patent fraud. Oh. Um, <laughs> naturally. Uh, that's, naturally, that's the only of reason course. you got to go back yeah, in the past. <laughs> absolutely. So it's a pretty ridiculous, <laughs> stupid, uh, hilarious thing, and uh, we're hoping to get that made in uh, in February, March, and uh, for next to nothing because we don't have any money. So if anyone wants to give us money, that's really why I brought this up. <laughs> so, uh, we could use money, um, but um, I'm soliciting funds through your podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it, it's stupid and i think it'll be really enjoyable but we have a twitter at time helmet and you can you know come and keep tabs on progress because i'm sure i'll spend a lot of my time uh taking pictures of it if we shoot into 8 20 at night anyway there'll be a pictures of set come february <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. yeah it kind of reminds me of uh the one of those x-men movies I, I don't know which one it was but where they transfer wolverine's consciousness back in time Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, oh, that days that of future kinda... past, I think. 
Um, what was yeah, it? that was it. Days of Future Past, I, I believe that was. Yeah. You know, bit of a yeah. fan. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Mm, bit, a of a little bit, you know. bit of a fan. Bit of a fan. Just thought I'd drop it in there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I sat, I sat behind Hugh Jackman at a movie once, so. Oh. So I guess that means wow. you're gonna like my movie. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> the connection. That's how that perfect. works. <laughs> yeah, because that's I'm basically Wolverine now. Yeah, yeah. basically. I'll make sure yeah. to keep an eye out for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, well, it was great to have you on the podcast, man. Uh, thank you for sp- taking the time out uh, to come and join us on here. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me, and thanks for listening, everybody. It's been a delight. All right. Uh, yes, and thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next one.